Na na nachman nachman meuman na na nachman nachman meuman. Do you have the slightest idea what that's all about? Where it comes from? Where it originated? With Hashem's infinite grace, may my words flow forth with ease. The Nanach movement is probably the most misunderstood phenomenon in Breslov Hasidus. In this episode, we are going to crack that can open. We're going to explore what the Nanach movement is, how it's associated with Breslov, with Rabbi Nachman, Uman Rosh Hashanah, and so much more, as well as explore some ideas pertaining to Breslov in general, why I connect to Rabbi Nachman's teachings, what are some of the stigmas that surround Breslov, and more. But before we go there, I would like to preface with a couple things. First and foremost, this episode is in honor of our newborn Neve Nachal, who was born here in Oman. I'm still in Oman, Ukraine right now. I'm recording during Chalamoid uh, Sukkot. Neve Nachal, translated as a streaming oasis, was born here in Oman, and his bris was just a few days ago. And we had the huge zechut, the merit, to make his bris right at the caver, right at Rebbe Nachman's tzien. Right before Rosh Hashanah, the weekend before, I was involved in helping organize a beautiful Shabbaton slash festival that was called Nachal Novea. For those who don't know, Nachal Novea is derived from Breslov as well where it is written that Rabbi Nachman is the Nachal Nevea Makor Chachma, the flowing brook and source of wisdom. The word Nachal Nevea, specifically Nevea, has Nova hidden in it. And the Shabbaton that I helped organize, or at least I did the uh, graphics and visual aspects of, was dedicated to October 7th and the Nova Music Festival Massacre. It was a stunning event, and if anything in this world could help you appreciate that music is life, that music is truly, truly life, it would be that Shabbaton. Now we fast forward a few weeks, and my son, Neve Nachal, also has a name that has its roots planted in Breslov and Rabbi Nachman's teachings. I'm not going to get into the entire definition and explanation of the name, but as you could see, my Kesher with Breslov and Rabbi Nachman runs pretty deep. I've been coming to Uman for Rosh Hashanah for about 15 years. I've been learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings, Lakute Mahoran, uh, for that same period of time. I'm pretty familiar with Breslov Outlook, Rabbi Nachman's teachings, and the overall consensus and scene. So let's get into it. Any Breslover has probably been accused of being a Nanach. A hundred percent of the time, the people calling a Breslover a Nanach have no idea what they're talking about. They're speaking out of ignorance. This is because they don't understand the distinction between the Nanach movement that has embedded itself within Breslov. If they would know the difference, the distinction, they wouldn't call every Breslover a Nanach. I've had that throughout my life. Most people don't really care to correct others. It doesn't really matter. Um, But we're using this episode as an educational piece for those who care. Calling a Breslover a Nanach would be akin to calling a Lubavitcher a Mishachist. So let's crack it open and see what's there. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov was the founder of the Hasidic movement called Breslov. Hence, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Some people say Rabbi Nachman of Oman. There's confusion between Breslov and Oman. The bottom line is, Rabbi Nachman founded and started the Breslov Hasidut. Rabbi Nachman chose to be buried in Uman for various reasons we're not going to get into. So the kibbutz, the people who go to visit him on Rosh Hashanah, go there, they go to Uman, they, they don't go to Breslov, but Breslov is the Hasidus. Just like with any Hasidut, there have been traditions that have been handed down in the Breslov Hasidut, father to son, father to son, all the way until today. And Breslov, just like any Hasidus, has their own customs. For example, I just learned this Rosh Hashanah that the true Breslovers who follow the traditional 
they don't sing the first night of Rosh Hashanah. It's a night of, I shouldn't say fear, but awe and seriousness. They don't sing, they hardly even talk. But if you go to Uman, you see there's a ton of singing. So Mata Frank was <laughs> laughing and he said that we're Hasidei Rabbi Nachman. <laughs> we're followers of Rabbi Nachman. We're not, you know, Breslerers. Um, it makes light of a nuanced situation, but it could help you understand that there is a Mesora, if you will, a tradition that the serious guys go by. And then there is what Breslov, Oman Rosh Hashanah, and everything surrounding Rabbi Nachman has become. One of the things that have become post Rabbi Nachman, after Rabbi Nachman passed away, more than a hundred years after Rabbi Nachman passed away, in about 1920s, there was a Breslov or Chassid by the name of Yisrael Ber Odesser. He lived in Israel. He was a devoted Breslov or Chassid. And the story goes like this. This is how the Nanach movement started. Rabbi Yisrael Ber Odesser was struggling on one of the fasts. I think it was the fast of Tammuz. And he succumbed to his urges and he ate. After eating, he felt so much guilt. So for days on end, he prayed. He was so guilt-ridden that he ate on one of these fasts. And during this days of prayer and devotion, a thought came into his head. Again, this is how the story goes. A thought came into his head that he should check his study, or he should go into his study, into his little library or room where he learns. So he goes into the study, which was locked, only he had the key. He opened up a random safer, and in the safer there was a there was a letter, a note, or a petek. And on that petek, there was some stuff written on it. Some stuff it said it was very difficult for me to come to you, blah 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 blah. blah. And then it signs on the bottom, the petek, the note was signed, Na Nach Nachma Nachman Mi Uman. Hello, a movement was born. Well, not so fast, but that's where the whole Na Na Nachma Nachma Mi Uman came from. It was on that petek. The petek, by the way, if you notice, some nanachs wear these necklaces with a little petek. That petek you typically has that note written on it. Okay, but this little note, it didn't actually have Yisrael Ber Odesser's name on it. It wasn't written to him. It was general. So Yisrael Ber Odesser, the tale goes, determined or thought that Rabbi Nachman himself put that note there after he passed away. So it was straight up miracle, and that because Yisrael's name wasn't on it, it applied to everyone. Before Yisrael Ber Odesser passed away, he sheared this... Now, before he passed away, he became obsessed with this, with this, um, with the line, Nana Nachman Nachman Yoman. He, he has even said that I am Nana Nachman Nachman Yoman, so it completely possessed him. He became it. He meditated on it, prayed on it, so on, so on, and so forth. Now, the acronyms, uh, the, the letters, they make up various things. It has certain hidden grammatrias and stuff, numerical values and stuff like that in it. But we're not going to get into all the technicalities. We're just trying to get a, a broader picture of what took place. He meditated and sang and he created an entire movement based off of this signature. Before he passed away, he shared this with some of his close followers. And essentially the Nanach movement started from there. So as you can see and understand that the Nanach movement became like a sub-movement in Breslov, embedded into Breslov. And there's contention, there's some disagreement with regards to the story. People were always skeptical about it. There, there's, there's second and third versions of the story. Maybe somebody dropped the letter on him when he was in shul and it wasn't in his study, blah, blah, blah. Some people think he was depressed, so his followers wanted to make him happy, so they did it to him. We stay away from all the drama and gossip that surrounds it. That was the story. That's how the movement started. But this is a movement within a Hasidut, you know, no different than the Mishachist movement within Chabad. But it's a movement that's based off of superstition, for the lack of better definition, right? It's a superstition to believe that Rabbi Nachman, his soul of some degree, placed a physical letter in a book that was in a locked study after he passed away is not the type of thing that your typical rational Hasidic 
person or even a breast of a chassid wants to contend with, wants to deal with, wants to believe. And so right then and there, you essentially have a divide. Now it's not, it's, it's a divide that has a lot of unity. And, and that's one of the reasons why Nanachs exist within Breslov, because there's not a lot of contention there. I could tell you, I don't know all the ins and outs and little details of how it evolved, but I could tell you the overall consensus from where we stand today. And that is that there's tolerance for it. But that's not to say that your average Breslover believes in the story. Quite the opposite. Somebody like myself, a Breslover chassid, I follow the teachings of Rabbi Nachman, I don't believe this story. It means absolutely nothing to me. It's very superstitious by nature. Rabbi Nachman himself was very much the opposite of superstitious. While a lot of the rabbis and even his own grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement to begin with, was all about mufsim, like doing things that were miraculous and above nature. He would heal people. He would make miracles come about. And a lot of the Hasidic masters were very much so into that. Not Rebbe Nachman. Um, and I'm sharing that now to kind of paint the picture of who Rebbe Nachman was and why he was slightly different. And just going along those same lines... I don't really buy into any superstitious things by nature. Rabbi Nachman was very practical. He put a huge emphasis on practical stuff. Closeness to Hashem, relationship, meditation, amuna. These are all very practical things. So the movement within a Hasidut was born, and it embedded itself very, very deep. Obviously, they make the most noise, just like... In Chabad, the Meshachist make the most noise. They're waving the Mashiach flags. And for outsiders, they may confuse the two. For the untrained eye, a Nanach and a Breslover are synonymous. But for those who know, it's a world apart. Accusing a Breslover of being a Nanach is like saying a Chabad guy is a Meshachist. You know, imagine calling Rabbi Manus Friedman a Meshachist. It won't go over so well, right? Because your typical mainstream Chabad rabbi and individual doesn't believe that the Rebbe is still alive. The Rebbe passed away. It's done, right? But because you have this movement within Chabad that believes the Rebbe is still alive and they make so much noise, you're going to have a portion of the population of the Jewish world who they conflate the two, they mix the two up, they're going to think that Chabad, Chabad Hasidim believe that the Rebbe is alive or that they think he's still Mashiach or all this stuff. So there's a lot of confusion around it. Now, within Chabad, there's not so much confusion. They understand. It's a subgroup. You know, they believe what they believe. They're hyped up about it. Fairy tales. It is what it is. But for outsiders, they have no idea. And it's the same thing with Breslov. There's a huge amount of tolerance for Nanachs. They bring joy and dance and song. And half of them are, are, are individuals who they would potentially be on the street. They would have no direction, nothing to connect to, um, no kesher to anything spiritual. So there's like this huge tolerance. Think of it as a Kirov thing. Like if, if you need to connect to Hashem through being wild and hipster and all this stuff, why not? Okay, so you believe in a superstitious story along the way. How much harm does it cause? In fact, a lot of these Nanachs, they learn Rebbe Nachman's teachings and they're, and they're real devoted breastlivers as well. There's just one layer more <laughs> that they believe than everyone else. I'm not saying it's good, right? Because believing in false things could lead to all kinds of uh, negative outcomes. Uh, but it's not inherently bad if you look at what the alternative is for a lot of these individuals. Okay, so that's that's essentially the story of the Nanach movement. That's how it embedded itself and it continues to grow. Now, what you need to understand is that I don't know the exact numbers, but I would estimate that Nanachs, real Nanachs, make up probably less than 5 or less than 3% of, let's say, people who go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, for example, or they make up less than 3% of actual breast livers. You have to understand how insignificant their actual numbers are. If you understand that, you understand that besides for the music and jumping around and wild stuff that they do and the impression that they make in the world, within Breslov, it's almost like a meaningless gesture to a certain degree. They're a drop in the ocean. Um, even this year, with the war still ongoing, many Americans didn't come. But Israelis, being that they have war in Israel, they're undeterred. I believe we had 40,000, 50,000 people here. 
of those 40, 50,000 people, how many do you think are nanachs, actual people who believe the story that I just said? Very few, percentage-wise. It might be a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand, but it's very few when you compare it to the grand scheme of things. Um, so it's really interesting how, and this is a reoccurring theme in life and in this world where it's just like the, the, the Palestinian jihadi supporters, you know, the, the guys on campus supporting Hamas. They make the most noise. It makes it sound like half of America is, is, is pro-Hamas. It's factually not true. It's just a group of imbeciles who make the most noise. So they get a lot of uh, exposure and it gives the impression that they matter. Um, they don't matter right? Jihadi supporting imbeciles on campuses don't matter. Um, if they get too large and rowdy, they'll be crushed down by freedom-loving America citizens. So in Breslov, it's a similar thing. It's like, how much does the Nanach movement matter when you have such a strong Hasidut with tens of thousands of followers, and then you have a subgroup who's making noise? But And, and it's not like in Lubavitch where they're pushing this agenda that the Rebbe is alive. They believe a story, and that story brings them joy. It brings them to song and dance and a couple other details, but it's not here nor there. There's no huge harm in it. The Kitsu. Now that you understand the nuance there, you'll probably realize and appreciate more who is and isn't a Nanach. So a couple things. First of all, this is why you'll never see mainstream personalities, mashpiyim, rabbis, and, and people who give over the lessons. You're not going to hear them say things like Nanach, Nachman, Nachman, Yom, and you're not going to see them wearing Nanach yarmulkes. You're probably not going to see them going crazy to Nanach music. Although I would venture to say that the music, it became such a thing in mainstream Judaism. Like, whatever, fine, it's music, who cares? But somebody like Shalom Arush, Rav Lazer Brody, Mata Frank, Gedalia Fenster, any of these guys, you don't see them rocking Nanach kippahs, you don't see them walking around saying Nanach, Nachman, Nachman, Miyoman, right? You just don't see any of that. Why? Because like I said, <laughs> they're not Nanachs. They probably don't believe the superstitious story. At a minimum, they stay away from it because it's too fringe. Just like you're not going to see uh, Rabbi Manus Friedman or Y.Y. Jacobson or these types waving a Mashiach flag. It's just not going to happen. And again, to the untrained eye, they might mix the two. But for somebody who knows, it's a world apart. You either believe that somebody who died is alive or you don't. And taking that leap says a lot about you know your level of coherence and practicality in the rational realm of thought. Another thing to note is that not everyone wearing a Nanach yarmulke is a Nanach. It's become so enmeshed into Breslau, this whole Nanach thing, that you'll see signs everywhere, Nanach, Nachman, Nachman, Yoman, just like you see Mashiach signs everywhere in Israel. People buy these yarmulkes that say Nanach on it, not because necessarily they're a Nanach. Either, believe it or not, a lot of Breslauers don't even know the full story that I just shared. They don't concern themselves with it. And when you go into the store here locally, right here on Pushkana, and they're selling these kippahs, and you need a white kippah for Rosh Hashanah or for Yom Tev or whatever, you might just buy it and stick it on your head. You may not even be a nanach. <laughs> um, that comes. That brings me to the fact that a lot of the people who wear these kippahs, the, the youngsters, this is more in the younger crowd, you'll see, the youngsters who come, they put on the kippah, they're dancing in the street, nanachs, they have no idea about this story. They, they have no idea about the movement and the belief. <laughs> There's so much ignorance surrounding the rituals, you know, the dancing and the singing that half of the people engaging in it have no idea what's behind it. And they don't need to. I'm not saying, oh, you come here, you put on a kippah, you're dancing, you don't know what you're supporting. It matters. It doesn't matter. It's spiritual, it's positive, it's good, fine. But as an educated individual, if you want to understand the phenomenon, you should understand that a lot of probably hundreds of people who come here, their first year or two or three, uh, have no idea about this stuff. I have friends who have been coming for five, 10 years. They probably don't even know this information. Because again, you could be, you could have a Kesher to Breslov, learn Rabbi Nachman stuff, and not know all this history, drama, 
gossip, like you just don't concern yourself with it. You just learn Rabbi Nachman's teachings. It gives you a connection to Hashem. You're a spiritual and devoted Jew. End of end of your understanding. But um, this episode is to bring it to light to those who want to understand and those who care about understanding. All right, so that was the story of the Nanach movement, how it ended up within Breslov, how it's so integrated into Breslov. And it could give you some nuanced understanding of, you know, in general, judging people, calling people by, by labels that they potentially have no association with, so on and so forth. Um, now let's go into some other interesting Breslov related stuff. One of my close friends grew up in New Square, and you may or may not know, but New Square is vehemently against Breslov. <laughs> uh, I find it so funny when certain Hasidut are against others. It, it, it's so like, it's so immature. You know, it's get over it. Like we're, we're past that, but we should be past it, but we're not, unfortunately. Sinat Chinam, fighting within, uh, it has plagued us all throughout history and it continues to. But anyway, but but Skvers, Skver was not far from Breslov, so they feel like they know something that others don't. Um, so, so my friend, he was pressing somebody who's a real devoted Skver and a real, really still in the community. He was pressing him, you know, give me some insight. Why are you, like, wh why are squares against Breslov? Like, tell me the truth. I really want to know. Wanna, give me some juicy gossip, right? And he was there avoiding it, you know. Squares, squares are sweethearts, by the way. So sweet. So, so edel. So, so graceful. So much potential. Anyway, um, and he pushed him and pushed him. The guy didn't want to say, but, you know, you push hard enough. It'll come out. So the guy tells him, amongst other things, he says that Rabbi Nachman failed in the area where Yosef Atzadik didn't in that test. Essentially, what he's saying is in the test of um, keeping the Brit, Shmirat Brit, Rabbi Nachman failed in that test, whereas Yosef Atzadik didn't. <laughs> Uh, so I caught a good laugh when he repeated this to me because, like I said, I've been in Breslov for more than a decade and I do care about the history, the tradition and various other aspects. And I've never heard anything remotely like this. So I knew off the off the top of my head that this is hogwash because if it was true, as we know, us, you know, religious Jews know that there would be gossip and rumors surrounding these types of things. Like something like that, you can't push under the rug. If it existed, I would have heard about it from somewhere, something. And I've never even heard anything remotely like it. In fact, I'm very familiar with Rabbi Nachman's teachings, how he speaks openly about that battle and all that stuff. So like, no. anyway, um, on Rosh Hashanah, we had the pleasure of sitting near and eating with uh, Rav Mata Frank. So we decided to ask him. And so we asked him, we said, you know, the, the square said that Rabbeinu fell in the area where Yosef Tzadik did it. <laughs> so he wasn't taken back. Potentially he is. he has heard these rumors. I don't know. Nothing really catches him off guard. Um, and he knows this stuff. Um, and he's like, no, quite the opposite. Rabbi Nachman talks about his own struggles. And, he's, and, and Rabbi Nachman writes that even he has come close to falling through in areas of sexual immorality, but he didn't. Um, the square is they just basically added one clause to the story. And they said he did fall through. You know, it's a little detail. Um, but it just shows you that when, when there's dissension and... and um, anger and hate, all kinds of rumors and lies and stuff like that will be spread. So it is known that Rabbi Nachman was tempted in those areas, just like every human being. Rabbi Nachman talks about it openly. It's one of the reasons why people connect with his teachings, because it's so real. It's not um, high in the sky, unattainable stuff. Rabbi Nachman talks about these challenges and talks about how to overcome them and the, the ability to overcome them. He speaks to the layman. And Rabbi Nachman writes that he himself was tempted, but was able to pull through. The squares took it one step further and said that he wasn't able to pull through. Um, there was also some other um, accusations that he was like psychotic. He would run in the street naked or, or go crazy, which there is no real um, record of it. Besides for the squares having those stories, um, there's no real 
history of that ever taking place. But again, anyone who grows up Hasidic in the community understands how gossip works, understands how allegations are made. And, you know, it's a lot easier to dislike and to hate something when it's reprehensible to you. And it's a lot easier for something to be repulsive to you if there's a story that goes against your values. That's all I'll say about that. So why do I connect with Breslov? Why am I not a Chabad Chassid? By the way, my family does come from Chabad. My father and mother were essentially married in Chabad. We were Chabad Chassidim before I was born, uh, before the Rebbe passed away. Growing up, we still held Chabad Minhagim. So I'm very familiar with Chabad, Chabad Outlook. But why Breslov? Like, what's the appeal? A lot of people in mainstream Judaism, mainstream Hasidus, they don't fully understand or appreciate the appeal of Breslov and the appeal of Rabbi Nachman's teachings. So I can't speak for others, but I can I could tell you from my experience why I connect with Breslov, why I connect with Rabbi Nachman's teachings. The answer is because Rabbi Nachman speaks my language. Every human being has a soul, and that soul connects to a path in Torah, path to God. And there's so many different paths, and you have to find a tradition, a mahalach, that works for your soul. The mahalach of Breslov works for my soul. For example, if you compare it with Chabad, why don't I go with Chabad? Chabad, so, so Breslov is very much feeling heart and soul. Chabad is very much intellect. Um, what does Chabad stand for? Chachma, Bina, Dat. All three of those things are up here. What are the emphasis that Rabbi Nachman puts down here? Amuna, simple Amuna, not brain Amuna, simple Amuna. Believing in Hashem like a toddler, personal prayer, Hidbodadut, uh, talking to Hashem in your own words, having a connection and a relationship with Hashem. So, Breslov, the Breslov outlook and Breslov teachings are very much connected to the heart, the feelings, the connection. Um, whereas, like I said, Chabad is very much intellect. Now, I'm no stranger to intellect-based Judaism. In fact, the philosophy that I dabble in is all brain, it's all intellect. Philosophy, epistemology, theology, ethics, morality, it's all up here. So you could say that Breslov is like my sweet escape into the heart, into the feelings, into the connection. To understand this, you have to look at some of Rabbi Nachman's biggest teachings and biggest emphasis. As I said, Amuna, the full and complete faith in one loving God, but simple Amuna. The emphasis has to be on simplicity because there's sophisticated Amuna. I could prove to you that God exists. That's not the Amuna we're talking about. Simple Amuna, just like a baby in a mother's arms intrinsically feels faith that they're taken care of. We're talking about that type of Amuna. Amuna, personal prayer, Hidbodadut, talking to Hashem, forming a relationship with Hashem from the heart. Gratitude, Teshuvah, repentance. All of these things are connection-based. Devekut. Devekut is one of the ultimate forms of meditation. Complete and utter attachment. You could do it through song. You could do it through silence. You could do it through prayer. You put that talus on and you form a deep, deep attachment. Um, and then, of course, the famous ones, you know, serving God with happiness. But what is happiness? Happiness is a feeling. So remember, it's all feeling. So breast lovers by nature, they're not necessarily not intellects, but it's certainly the crop, the portion, the population of people who want to connect, possibly let go, or perhaps that is their way of understanding the world through emotions, through feeling. Myself, being into Hasidut in general, I will learn the teachings of just about any anyone, any movement, because I like to understand, I like the education. But when it comes to connection and when it comes to having a path, a person has to choose one. Otherwise, you have no tradition that you follow. And when you have no tradition that you follow, you will essentially allow yourself to follow no tradition at all. That's essentially what happens. It's the teva, it's the nature of human beings. 
So Breslov, Rabbi Nachman's teachings are very near and dear to me. I've been coming here, like I said, for about 15 years. Everything I pray for, I achieve. Everything I pray for that is good, I achieve. In fact, through Rabbi Nachman's teachings, I have learned to pray and only request that the things that are good should materialize. I don't tell Hashem, you know, give me a million dollars because I want a million dollars because I think I know what to do with a million dollars. Even if I occupy the fantasy that I'm going to use the million dollars for good, I pray for spiritual things and I beg Hashem essentially to only deliver them if they're going to be good for my soul correction and for my spiritual journey. Because we know that through prayer you can force issues and Hashem will deliver and in many cases, you will regret the very things that you prayed for because they will come in ways and they will come through modalities that will destroy you. Or simply receiving them will lead to things that are not good. But hey, you prayed, you wanted, you asked for it. Actions have consequences. So we learn how to pray. We learn how to ask for things. But more than anything, gratitude, being grateful for the things we have. Anyway, that's the story of Breslov. I'm extremely grateful that I had the zechut to have my son's bris at the Rebbe's Tzian. Bezrat Hashem, he will choose to be a light of Torah and Amuna. And certainly for all of us, we have a choice how we want to conduct ourselves as Jews. There are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of paths, you know, 70 or 71 paths symbolically, traditionally, but there's hundreds if not thousands of paths that we could choose from that will lead us down the straight path that will lead us to truth to Hashem we have to choose one otherwise we're lost I'm eternally grateful that I was introduced to the teachings of Rabbi Nachman at a good age it helped me build my foundation in Judaism my understanding is in Hasidut in general uh, which 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 brings me to one final point. Some people may wonder, why is Hasidut important in general? And the answer to that is simple. Judaism was stagnant. Coming into the 18th century after Shabtzi Tzvi, Frankism, and all, all of the craziness that Jews have been going through, your typical Jew hardly knew the Aleph base. They didn't even know the Hebrew alphabet. People were so ignorant, so detached, Along came the Baal Shem Tov and started the Hasidic movement. What did he essentially do? He took the Kabbalah, the teachings of Kabbalah, watered it down, made it understandable and digestible to simple Jews. Through this, Hasidus was born. Hasidism was born. And all of these sects, which were followers of the Baal Shem Tov and Agru and Agru and Agru, they opened up and you have all these, all of these Hasidic sects. But Hasidus was an imperative revelation to the world of Jewry at a pivotal time. I believe that it essentially saved Judaism. In fact, what do we see now? We see that ultra-Orthodoxy centered around Hasidut is the driving force of Judaism. Anyone who is becoming more progressive, any movement that becomes more progressive, like the modern Orthodox, are either going so far left that they end up assimilating, or they're bouncing back to the right because that middle ground doesn't work so well, and certainly going to the left doesn't work because it dries up all tradition and ritual. So Hasidism rolled around in a point of history that was vital. It revitalized Judaism, and it is indeed the driving force of Judaism and our actual traditions. That's why Hasidut in general, from a bird's eye view, was so important. Why it's important on an individual level is because the teachings that is brought down from Kabbalah are simply put necessary for Jews in our times. It's that simple. The hidden secrets, the, the, the wellspring of knowledge, insight, and strength that is derived from Kabbalistic teaching and insight is absolutely and utterly necessary for Jewish people to get through the challenges that we're going through these days. Kabbalah goes into everything. It touches on psychology, on our emotions, on our devotions, on our purpose, on pretty much everything. But without it, we would not have the tools, the utilities 
to get through these trying times. Rabbi Nachman says that before the coming of Mashiach, the world will be like a blanket being shooken. Shooken? Shaken? I don't know. And to hang on to our amuna, to our faith, it'll be like holding on to that blanket while it's being shaken. It, to illustrate how difficult it is, Rabbi Nachman foresaw and he predicted that a huge, huge wave of atheism was going to plague the coming generations, and he was right. This is what we're dealing with. Just massive, massive plague of atheism. And even if it's not direct atheism challenging God, it challenges God and morality from every direction, from every other direction, which ultimately leads to challenging God itself. So again, we needed more tools in our box, quote unquote, to combat this. The Kabbalah was necessary for this purpose. And of course, we can't understand Kabbalah just by opening up a Zohar and reading it. We don't even understand the language, let alone the definition. That's where Hasidut and Hasidic teachings come in. It takes all of these mysteries and these secrets and it brings it down for the common man. We connect to it. It's vitality for us. It gives us life and encouragement and strength and ability to fight on and to fight on. That's why we connect to Hasidut. That's why Hasidut is so powerful and influential in the Jewish world these days. Thank you so much for tuning in. With Hashem's help, I pray that you find your path to Him, your Mahalach, to a connection with Him. Peace and love. Leave a like and subscribe.